Well, uh, songwriters, uh, I guess I've always felt the most important thing is I've got that desire, you know, uh, that, that I've got to write, I've got to write, you know, this is what, what I'm meant to do. Uh, the biggest breakthrough for me was when I actually started writing honestly, you know, from my own emotions, rather than copying other songs that that I had learned from, or uh, some of my other favorite songs. Uh, when I sat down and started pouring my heart out about my own problems or what I was going through at the time, it turned out that was the secret to reaching out to people. Those were the songs that were accepted by people because uh, of what music is itself, it's just uh, a way of communicating with people and sharing our our emotions, you know, I'm saying we're all in this thing together, you know. Uh, and that kind of happened to me with Drift Away, because I had actually, when I came up with the melody for that song, it was, I was going a whole different direction. I got up on a Saturday morning, was going to go fishing, and I had, I had my first publishing deal with Herb Alpert, at uh, A&M Records for six months and I had a $75 a week advance but uh, I had been in LA for 10 years pitching songs you know and I was writing good commercial songs but there was something lacking in them and that was that heart you know? so I've always said you know write, write honestly your feelings and you'll connect with people uh, the craft will come together in time, you know, the rhyme, rhyming when you need to, and the cool melodies, and uh, I learned from old love songs. I learned from some of the Tin Pan Alley songs that my dad used to sing to my mom. Simple little two verses and a chorus song that said so much, you know. Uh, Bing Crosby, you know, uh, singing Moonlight Becomes You and uh, uh, Here's That Rainy Day, you know, and uh, some of the road pictures, Bing Crosby and Bob Hope. Uh, the simple little love songs. And, and, I, and when I was a kid, we had such a variety of music on radio, on one station. Uh, it was all kinds of influences that came in, you know. Uh, going back to the first time Elvis was on TV and and Johnny Horton before that, you know, and we had Hank Williams on the radio at the same time we had Elvis, you know. So, uh, heavily influenced by the Beatles in high school. Uh, but if uh, uh, there's any one thing I could say, that if you keep writing and keep writing, the craft will come together. You know, you'll, you'll learn that from loving music and listening to enough music. The craft will come together, but without the heart in it and the emotion in it, then uh, you're not going to be touching people. Is there anything you tell... Don't, don't be afraid to say. <laughs> don't be afraid to write from the heart, you know. Yeah. It really expose yourself, but... but uh, uh, it works, you know. I, I don't know how many people come up to me and said, "My, I was going through that right at the time I heard that song," you know, or that makes me think of my wife every time I hear what something happened to me and my wife, or uh, you were telling me a minute ago where you were when you heard "Drift Away." And, uh, that song ended up, ended up being about how I was feeling that day, about putting so much time into music pitching songs in L.A. and thinking nothing was ever going to happen, you know. I was about to get dropped for my first six months and there was my big chance gone, you know. It's like nothing's working out, but man, play me that song and I'm happy again, you know, the, the healing power of, of music. You know? And I had no idea how it would affect people, you know. I, I believed in it. Uh, after I recorded the song with Dolby here in Nashville, uh, they didn't really 
really like it that much at Decca Records. They thought it was too long. They didn't believe in it as a single. It was. It had an intro that was one thing, and the verse was one thing, and the chorus was another thing. And radio wanted a, a two-minute snappy song at that time, you know. So I really had to fight to get that released, and uh, it, it took off fast. And it, it worked. You know. How did Dobie hear it? Were you friends with him? Yeah, I was. Or work, yeah, I was playing in a club in L.A. with a band. You know, I had a band called Georgia Overdrive out there. And Dolby was playing uh, with a band called Pollution, uh, with Tata Vega and people like like that. You know, Dolby was around Hollywood working at the Whiskey Go Go and things. But I always loved Dolby's voice. He was like Sam Cooke to me, you know. Um, and Dolby and my brother were friends. Is how I met Dolby. But I got Dolby to sing some demos for me, and I took him over to to Decca. Went around knocking on doors with these demos, and they gave us a very small budget to go in and record. And I decided that after one trip to Nashville that I wanted to use rhythm section in Nashville, and it turned out to be a life-changing experience for both Dolby and for me. You know, so this town means a lot to me. I, I cut tracks here, living in L.A., I cut tracks here for years before I moved to Nashville and uh, ended up working in London, producing records in London for A&M and RSO, but there was nothing like Nashville back in the days of the 70s when things were changing a lot at that time. What was it like when uh, music grew? Well, it was completely different. It's a whole different world than it is today. Uh, it was before they widened the streets. <clears throat> My first morning here, uh, I got up and said, just walked down 16th Avenue with my guitar, went to RCA and knocked on the door and said, I'm a songwriter. I'm here in town to play some songs. And they, they said, just a minute. And they came back and said, yeah, Mr. Atkins is in his office. Go on in there and he's, he's waiting, waiting for you. And uh, it was it was like that in those days, you know. So I ended up sitting on the fireplace playing songs with Chet Atkins. Was my second hour in town, you know. A uh, little different today. What happened it, in that session? It was wonderful, you know. I was a nervous wreck, of course. I was saying Chet Atkins, you know, and then uh, and I played my little songs. Driftway was one of them. He loved it, you know. Uh, but he was just wide open to new writers, and he'd pick up his guitar and play along with you, and it's like very, very comfortable. And uh, he was just a great, great gentleman, and made me feel at ease within a minute, you know. And said, yeah, that's a good little lick right there, you know. Isn't that cool? I'll, I'll play this with it, you know. Let me try this with it, you know. We almost ended up writing together, you know. It was, uh, it was like that. That same day, I met Troy Seals, uh, who became a writing partner of mine for years. Troy wrote Seven Spanish Angels and Lost in the 50s, and he's written so many hits. But Troy and I wrote together for maybe 20 years. Was he painting houses when you Well, him? yeah, he was building a, building a, the steps at Quadratronic Studio, where we ended up recording with Dolby. Um, and it's because of Troy. Uh, and I was walking by and I said, hey man, you know, he said, hey, what are you doing? And I'm going to stop and talk a minute. And I said, oh, I'm a songwriter in L.A. and I'm trying to get people to listen to songs. He said, well, come on in, man. We have a publishing company here. And uh, I played some songs and then Troy played some. And I said, I felt like, well, I better go back to L.A., man, and uh, give myself a couple more years before I come back here. If everybody, if the guy Carpenters are writing songs like this, you know. But Troy and I hit it off big time, you know. And he introduced me to that rhythm section, David Briggs, and uh, from David and moved on. I went to some some sessions where I was, I, I just showed up sessions, say, could I come in and listen to what's going on here? And I said, yeah, come on in. And I heard Kenny Malone on a Diane Davison session, you know, and Weldon Myrick. And uh, within a week here, I'd probably been to 20 recording sessions. And uh, just everything was wide open. 
everybody was was you were welcome welcome here everybody was a songwriter they had the little bars every bar you went in everybody was a songwriter you know and uh, we're all here for the same reason trying to get some songs cut you know but deeply in love with songwriting you know it just it was so passionate you know makes me think of like maybe Paris was back in the, th the 30s or something it's amazing you meet somebody and end up writing a song with them the same evening, you know. How does that feel when you write? How did that feel when you start writing songs? You co-write, and seeing you and your co-writer's life change? I mean, yeah. Did they change with the success, yeah. with life getting better? Yeah. What kind of feeling was that? You know, it's kind of strange. Life? It's hard to think of because I always felt pressure. Uh, I had one enormous hit. And I didn't want that to be the only thing, you know. And also I had, I did a lot of assignment writing. My publisher would say, uh, Three Dog Nights getting ready to record and they're anxious to hear a song from you. You know, so knowing that that opportunity was there, uh, starting from scratch, trying to come up with the right thing, you know. Uh, but having the opportunity puts it, put more pressure on. So I, I never really stopped to think how things were changing for me too much because I, it just, the pressure kept growing to write one more good one, write one more good one, you know. Gotta hope I'm not out of songs yet, you know. And uh, I would work on a song for, for days, you know, and then just leave it alone finally for a while and come back to it and it was so easy to see after a while. Uh, but I don't feel any different right now than I did uh, back in those days. I've really been through a lot. I've, I've got to meet so many of my heroes. And they've recorded my songs. I can't believe it, you know? I can't believe it, but it really hasn't changed the way I write songs or how I worry about finishing them, you know? I've got to write a song for the Cowboy Hall of Fame here in about two weeks. Um, I'm jotting down notes all day long now, you know, thinking that this has to be just right, man. It's Cowboy Hall of Fame. This has to be just right. It's the same. Things are different. I've, I've, you know, uh, they, when Paul McCartney called me, uh, he had some demos that, that I had, uh, songs I had written, and, and a lot of them were around guitar licks. And he was, they were doing the Wings tour and they were in Canada and I, I thought it was a joke when the phone rang, but it was Paul McCartney saying, we're going to be at Record Plant uh, in three days. And I've got some of your demos. Uh, I'm going to produce uh, some records with Kenny Jones, uh, who was Rod Stewart's drummer at that time. But then he went into The Who uh, when Keith Moon died. Uh, but Kenny had played these songs for Paul. He loved them, called me and said, will you come and play guitar on the sessions? Kenny's gonna be playing drums. If you play guitar and do the vocals. So I was a nervous wreck, you know. Paul McCartney was big as a calm, you know, hero for me. And he, he walked in the door at record plant saying, give me the beat, boys, and free my soul. I wanna get lost. And immediately, at ease. He was like anybody else on session that was enthusiastic and happy to be there, you know. Uh, it's amazing that I could get past the fact that he was Paul McCartney because I was in a uh, little vocal booth playing acoustic guitar with a lick and singing a lead vocal that would be later discarded. But we did have vocals with me and Paul and Linda singing uh, the, the three songs that I, that I had written that they had picked for that album. But I, so I've had experiences like that and Ray Charles coming up and hugging me and saying, hey, I'm recording your song, man, what a great, came out great. You know, I've traveled all over the world. It seems like some of it's almost a different life because at the time those things were happening to me, I had limos picking me up, you know, and I was living at the Dorchester and I was living at the Plaza in New York and 
I was working on projects I couldn't believe I was working on. But as I sit here today, actually, I see some of these new artists in town that are breaking through or just beginning to break through. Uh, I don't feel any different than them at all. Just, uh, uh, it's, it's never changes, you know. You've got another song to write. <laughs> whether you, whether you're doing it for money anymore, you know, if you've got a project you're working on or you're trying to get a song cut, if I have an idea, it's important to me uh, that I uh, I still feel that pressure to get it done. So it doesn't change, you know. Do you still write much? Uh, I've been writing with a group called Alvarado Roadshow, and I love them. You know, it's just, I, I met them, I guided them on a fly fishing trip, a wilderness horseback fly fishing trip in the San Juan Mountains in Colorado. And I met them and they, they came along with a group we took up in the mountains to go fly fishing. Uh, I, I love to fly fish and I have a lot, there's a lot of ranches up where I live in northern New Mexico and a lot of outfitters and I'm often asked to go, to go and uh, help on these, these trips at times. And this happened to be, uh, we spent a month up in the wilderness on horseback and we have one group come up for six the six hour ride up to our camp and really in wilderness. They had no idea what they were getting into. But Cleve and AJ Clark were, were coming along with the group and brought their guitars. And they were invited just to come with a wealthy group that was paying a lot of money to go fly fishing. Um, and I was guiding them. They couldn't believe when I, they got up there that I was guiding them on their fly fishing trip. That's how we met. And that was 9-11, by the way. We were up there during 9-11 and had no idea what was going on in the world. When we came back down in 9-17, we came out of the mountains. But uh, I've been writing with them ever since, and we've written some great songs, and, and they're great. But no, I've been writing mostly, uh, I've write, been writing some songs with Jamie Houston, who did a lot with uh, uh, High School Musical. And he's a writer and record producer for Disney. Uh, and I'm going to be working with Jamie some more on the follow-up thing for High School Musical they're putting together right now. I, actually, I've already written a few songs with Jamie that hopefully will end up on this new project they're doing. Um, so I've always got something going on like that, you know? When you go to a co-write, what do you go in with? Ammo. Yeah. So, yeah. so what's ammo to you? Ammo is like something started, you know, something, uh, two or three songs I've started, something I feel good about, you know, I, very seldom except for some, somebody that I was so close to as Troy, would we, would I show up uh, like if somebody at Disney wants me to come write a song, you know, I'd, I would have two or three things prepared before I got there. You know, to say, well, how about this? How about this? How about this? You know, because uh, I didn't want to sit there just with somebody new and look at them and say, what are we going to write? You know, so I'd always make sure we had something I felt good about to start on. You know, uh, and I always try to come walk in the door with an idea. Don't don't often just start off cold. You know, we used to Troy and I and Will Jennings used to meet in the mornings. At, Mark Keddy's at eight o'clock and have coffee and say, well, what are we going to write, you know? Pick up the menu and says, Sweet Georgia Honey. So, ah, there's an op there's a opening line right there. Okay, let's go write that, you know? Yeah. But, but that's after writing a hundred songs together, you know? But if I get called into Disney or Universal or something like a project like that, uh, the, if there's a script involved, that tells me what to write. Uh, and put heart into it, you know. Uh, story's already there. I just have to uh, make you feel it, you know. Uh, but in most cases, like Ask Apple, maybe have somebody for me to write with. I'll I'll have three or four songs started before I meet them you know, to see if we're in the same world. Have you ever had a period where you really just didn't write much? Yeah. Yeah. Um, How did that happen? That, that actually, they were actually kind of healthy. 
Uh, I go fishing. You know, I go fly fishing. You know, I realized I would just written myself in, into a corner. You know, I was working too hard, concentrating too much on the craft of writing, and not enough of letting a natural thing come out. Getting away from it for a while, like I said, is really a great idea every now and then. If you're working that much, uh, come back and look at it and go, God, why couldn't I see that? You know, I just sat there until I couldn't think anymore, you know. Uh, go fly fish for a while, you know, and you're standing in the river going, yeah, oh, yeah, I see, I see, you know. Just let, give your, your brain a little room, you know. So, I'd get so intense, I'd work two or three days on a song without stopping, you know. I, I just couldn't put it away. Well, what, what are you doing in that process? Are you writing down just a bunch of possibilities and narrowing down? I mean, a couple days in a row in a song. How does that work for you? Do you just fill up a legal pad of what could work? Or oh, what I did not fill up a pad for sure, yeah. Yeah, I was, I, told, I was just trying to be as clever as I could possibly be instead of leaving it alone when it was good to begin with, you know, that I had the, I had the right thing at one time and I, uh, I'd write past it, you know. I'd, I'd start rhyming every other word, I'd try to be as clever as I could be and then I'd realize you know what, this is where the heart's at. It's that simple little version you wrote in the beginning is it, man, leave it alone, you know. But I've always been one of those people that people will come to me uh, when they need, when they've got an idea, uh, like artists I'll go on the road with. So they have an idea, but they don't know how to put it together, you know, and somehow it'll click with me and I, I'm a, a cleaner upper or a finisher, you know. Having songs recorded from diverse as Waylon Jennings, Rod Stewart, yeah. and many others, were those projects that you just wrote the song and somehow they, one got to Waylon he liked, one got to Rod he liked, or were you writing more specific for Rod Stewart? God had a song, I, I think you know, God has a lot to do with it. Yeah? <laughs> uh, yeah, because it's, it's amazing how some songs got to people. You know, there was always my publisher and song pluggers, but I I got more songs cut just by running into people, by being there, you know, make, making friends with people who knew somebody else, and somebody I'd give a song to, and somehow or another, at a party, they said, let me play you this song, you know. Uh, a lot of things came down that way, you know. Did you meet I, Rod and hand him a song, or? No, I, I, or? I did meet Rod at a party with, with uh, Paul McCartney, and. He didn't have much to say to me, you know, he was like, I said, thanks for recording my song. And he goes, yeah, that's it. That was our conversation, you know, yeah. that was it with Rod, you know, he, he didn't have anything to say to me, you know, he, he wasn't interested in me at all. You know? What about but, Waylon? How did Waylon? Oh, Waylon and I were friends for years. Cause when I was recording uh, at uh, Quadraphonic, Waylon was working at uh, Glazer Brothers studio right right next door. So we were always jumping over the fence at each other's uh, sessions, you know, two in the morning. Say, How's it going over here, you know? When show up with a bottle of tequila and I have some. You know, it was pretty wild back in those days. And, uh, we did a lot of hanging out, you know. So we and I were friends and I'm, he'd hear, he knew everything I was writing because we were, together so much, you know, uh, and he'd hear one and say, man, I, I like that one, you know, it, it was just from being, at those days he ran into everybody on Music World, you know, there's two or three places where people are going to be and the sessions were at 10, 2, and 6, and 10, and the breaks in between, and if you went to mods and mods for lunch, everybody was there, you know, in between the sessions, so. And you could go in the studio and drop off a song, you know, and it would get listened to. So it's it's different today. Advice for artists today, I think, oh, you just got to take every opportunity to be seen. If there's any way you can get in the Bluebird and play, or if there's any showcase in town you can do, because uh, uh, I, I know it's a lot different now. It's 
they actually have signs on the doors that say no unsolicited material and uh, you've got to uh, find a way to be seen here in this town. Play any place you can, talk to everybody you can, you know, make all the friends you can. But uh, I know like playing songs with Tony Brown is like going into an inquisition, man. You know, it's like, it's not easy. The song pluggers have to be, definitely do not waste his time when they're coming in for, and he's looking for a song for an album. You know, it's, uh, people are nervous about playing songs these days, you know. It's like um, very, very difficult to get a song cut. It's not like they, they'd hear a song and believe in it and cut it. It's, it touches, I think everybody's worried about it so much. Uh, they're demoing songs and sending them out to DJs, you know, to get opinions before they record them. You know, and that's pretty strange, I think. Rather than to just say, hey, I believe in this song, let's record it. Yeah. Have you ever been germed? Germed? Right. When somebody comes up and hands you CDs, they don't know you. Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah. Tell us, one of the sections we have is called Germing 101. Oh, yeah. So people learn what not to do. Oh, yeah. Well, oh, it's definitely don't bother people at the wrong time, you know. It, you make friends, you know. If you see somebody you want to pitch a song to, come up and say hi or whatever. But usually in between sessions, one thing these guys want to do is get away from music and have a, a rest, you know. And uh, there's there's a wrong time to pitch a song. The guys go, oh no, I'm just finally getting a chance to eat, you know. And uh, a lot of guys are open to say, yeah, leave it with me, you know, but I've had people come up and start singing songs to me, you know, and that's just, don't ever do that. You know, it's, it's, and then, but wait, you gotta hear the second verse, you know, and then, then the chorus said, here's the cool part of the chorus, you go, I'm here with friends and I'm trying to eat. So, so don't do that. Don't do that to, to an artist, you know. Um, best thing to do is say, hi, I'm so-and-so. Is there some place I can drop off a song for you, you know? Yeah, but uh, to, try to, to try to get somebody to come out to your truck and listen to a song when they're doing something else or, or to sing them a song while they're having dinner is a real mistake. <laughs> Because it's changed so much, and obviously it's a lot more barriers and hurdles. What encouragement could you give people as far as you know, sticking with it and just pushing on? Yeah, yeah. I would just say I was blessed, you know, that I knew what I wanted to do when I was in high school. I was just I wanted to be a songwriter. I, I wanted to stand up on stage and play guitar. I grown up listening to music in our family, just nothing professional, just that we loved it. But I knew I was just totally in love with music. And if you feel that way, uh, and stick with it, it's, it really is a blessing to know, to love something that much. If you love it that much and you stick with it, uh, somewhere along the way, God's going to lead you into a situation that's going to work out, you know. But, be at every door you can be at, be, be where it's happening. You can't do it from staying on the ranch in New Mexico. You've got to come down and, and be on the streets and try to see every person you can see. But if you've got that feeling, that love for it in you, that's the head start right there. You know, and, and you'll, you have to give up things for it. I lived in garages. I'd, I'd had no car. I, I got rid of everything. I hawked things. I did whatever I could to continue writing songs and just get by, you know, staying with somebody where I can write and have another chance to, uh, to pitch a song to somebody. But if you love it that much, you get these little thrills along the way, these little points of encouragement that seem huge. You know, it's a, so and so like this song, you know. It's like, yay, yay, you know. So every little tiny step, or I'm, I'm going to play down at the Flying Jib, and I got a, a gig. I'm getting paid, you know, to go play. That seemed enormous to me at the time, you know. 
So each little step along the way is a pat on the back and is a new thrill and a new encouragement, you know, that kind of leads you to all of a sudden one day some song turns out to be God says, okay, <laughs> you love it, it's your turn, you know, and uh, through some s sort of pattern of through people or whatever, it's going to get to the right person. Somebody record it and it ends up on the radio and you're driving down the road and going, oh my God, thank you, thank you, thank you. But it's all those little bits of encouragement that you get along the way. You know, keep following those and, uh, uh, and believing in yourself and writing from your heart.